good evening or afternoon wherever you are in the world. My name is Gabo Ratz, but many people here in the group just call me by my nickname, which is Gabs. Um, I run a history magazine out of Budapest, Hungary, so who, <laughs> it's a pretty special business. Um, but yeah, if you don't already know me, basically our business is a family business. I'm the second generation, so you know, in the future, if you want to ask me questions and maybe your business is a family business as well, and maybe you are struggling with a couple of things, then yeah, I can <laughs> completely relate to those experiences uh, and, you know, send some of those kinds of questions my way as well. But really what I specialize in is growing companies through online marketing and sales funnels. And that's actually the topic around which I think most of the questions today are based. So um, let's jump right in and yeah, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions in the meantime, then, you know, just type them here below the video. So first question comes from Randy Hanks. And the question is, how can I make hiring an intern from a local college for marketing and social media successful? business description and background. <clears throat> I am not a social media expert, so I would like to hire or intern a junior or senior student who, who is practicing studies in marketing and social media. I would like one to help promote leagues, corporate parties, kids' birthdays, and special events. Would you recommend going this route or hiring someone that has their degree? Would you recommend the amount of hours a week to start? Also, should I offer commissions? Your thoughts, thank you. So great question. And I do actually have a lot of relevant experience to this question because I have hired some of my best employees and longtime employees actually that have been with our company for years now um, out of university or college. And uh, most of them I actually hired while they were still a student. So they started working for me part time and uh, they ended up staying afterwards. So this is actually a topic I'm really <laughs> happy to talk to you about. Um, so a couple of things with hiring from a college. Um, one of the things I would recommend, I don't know if you have this in the US as well, here in Hungary, we have student organizations within the university, which basically specialize in, you know, certain activities. Um, like one student group I was a part of, for example, did a lot of tax advice related stuff. So, you know, a lot of companies came to us who were looking for people with an expertise in that kind of an area. So this is one thing you might want to take a look at, whether or not the universities and colleges in your area have any kind of specialized student groups, student organizations, basically anything that is student run, I would recommend those ones as well. But, you know, if it's run by the faculty, it, it doesn't mean they're disqualified. Um, but I would definitely look for a couple of student organizations that deal with, um, you know, basically the kind of uh, work or the, or the field that you are looking uh, for someone. Because, you know, basically what I found is that a lot of uh, college students have tons of relevant experience, even though they have never had a job. Uh, the ones that actually do a lot of extracurricular activities so that would actually be one of my primary things to look at or on anyone's resume or, or whenever I'm having a conversation with someone who I want to hire out of university is like, okay, like, honestly, I couldn't give a damn about their grades. Like, I don't care. The thing I care about the most is like, hey, what do you do at university outside of your classes, outside of your learning hours? Like, because, you know, Everyone goes to class, sure, but like, like, what are the extra things that are doing that distinguish you from from all the others? Because like, I can speak from my own experience actually, um, and maybe we did. <laughs> this is actually why it became um, my main criteria. Like when I was at university, I really did a lot of stuff outside the classroom, which was just you know basically training myself in various uh, different skills and. Um, yeah, like that would be my number one question. So when it comes to actually hiring someone, let's say, you know, you're through the interviews, you found someone who um, has some relevant 
you know, maybe may, like, like really, I would not make it a priority that they have job experience. Like after all, you're trying to hire a student, like don't expect them to have any job experience whatsoever. Cause you know, most likely you're going to be their first experience. Um, in terms of, hmm, yeah, like, I guess part of your question is, would you recommend going this route or hiring someone that has their degree? Like, like, you know, as I said, there's really no disadvantage in my opinion to hiring a student. In fact, you will actually find a lot of them are very motivated and they will actually come up with a lot more ideas than someone who has already finished their degree. They have, you know, had a couple of jobs because um, they're just going to be like very, very anxious to prove themselves to you and, you know, probably to themselves as well. So yeah, like I would definitely look at hiring someone without a degree. Um, amount of hours a week, like, you know, remember, they're going to be probably studying full time, which, you know, again, I don't know how colleges in the US work, like here where I'm from. Usually that means, you know, maybe 20, 30 hours a week at most. Um, so, you know, the hires I made from university, I always employed them uh, with about 20 hours a week, but we kept it flexible. So like, you know, if they had an exam period, it's fine. Like, you know, they can take some time off, but like on most weeks, you know, even though they, they were contracted for 20 hours, they would do overtime. I would pay them for, for overtime. And, you know, that probably worked out well for everyone. Cause yeah, like, like I would really recommend like have a base salary that you pay them for the 20 hours, like make, make that 20 hours the standard and do pay them for overtime because like they're going to be a lot more motivated like a lot of people at uh, university or college level like they you know you hear all this fluff about like yeah like the most important part of a job is like fulfillment and feeling appreciated and that like college kids really care about the money so make sure that you know if they do something that's overtime they do something for you that's outside of their job description pay them for it and uh yeah, like for a college student, I would really not offer a commission. I don't think it's necessary um, to keep them motivated. Like paying for overtime, in my opinion, is much more important in this case. Um, <clears throat> I would, however, come up with a couple of things if they are successful, where, you know, maybe on a certain important project, like maybe I would give them, um, you know, some kind of bonus for completing the work, maybe like not really an end of year bonus, but something tied to performance, something something tied to a job really well done. And, you know, if you make a habit of doing this, like, you know, not every month, but like every time that they do a really special and great job, it's gonna really reinforce your image as a good place to work, which is really what you want. Because like, I think the main drawback or the main problem with hiring people out of college is the risk of them like you know sticking around for half a year and then going off to what they perceive as a real workplace so like you know if you actually find someone who you find is good at their job and suits your company culture your main challenge is going to be to actually convince them like hey this is the place where you want to stick around and, and, you know, stay here for three years, five years, whatever it is. Cause like, you know, most of their peers, they're going to be going out to, you know, large corporations to work. They're going to be looking at a corporate career because that's what most universities are built around. And, you know, as a small business owner, you really have to uh, <laughs> kind of imagine this as a sales situation where you have to sell them on the idea of working for you. Um, but yeah, these are my tips to begin with. Uh, I really wish you a lot of luck because like I really enjoyed working with university students in the past and I still do. Um, actually my number two who has come out and flown out with me to an AO event in Nashville uh, this year was one of my highest from uh, a university. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun and you know, just make sure that um, you realize that even though you know they work on your team you're also like a huge part of their lives because you know if you're like their first or second job experience then uh, you know if you do it right you're gonna be a really special person and place in their lives as well so just make sure you are um aware of that and and you know just treat them nicely
So the next question comes from Karen from Crowders, and their question is, how do you get featured on podcasts consistently? Background of the question. I run a product photography agency focusing on creating unique, scalable content for brands. I have been a guest on two podcasts, one of which was through a referral, the other one I met at a networking event. I'm wondering if expanding my audience through podcasting is a viable idea, and so what are the best ways of going about finding podcast hosts and getting featured on them? So, Carrington, I remember answering at least two or three of your questions on my uh, mentor session two weeks ago, and you may recall that I told you to get a trilogy of books during that mentor session, and I'm going to be you know, just drilling these home. Like, there's a reason I have these on my desk. Secret Trilogy by Russell Bronson. And if you got that trilogy already, then Traffic Secrets is the book where you will find this answer. And it's a strategy called the Dream 100. It's a chapter in the book. So, you know, I don't get any commissions out of this, but I really should because I'm like really trying to get everyone to buy these books because like we have them. We have a lot of foundational stuff that we can, you know, use during these conversations and make these mentor sessions easier for me as well. Um, but yeah, really get Traffic Secrets by Russell Bronson and the Dream 100 strategy, which is a chapter in the book, <clears throat> is really what you're going to be looking for. But, you know, just to answer your question quickly and, and simply, um, there's really no way around, like, like if you want to get featured on podcasts, it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of kind of manual labor on your part. And... You know, there's this saying about digging your well before you're thirsty. Uh, obviously, like, what you could do is, hey, like, just go on Apple Podcasts or, or, or Spotify Podcasts and look at the top 100, 200 podcasts in whatever category you're interested in, which is, you know, the category that most of your dream customers are going to be likely to listen to. And you could just, you know, start shooting messages to every single podcast host. Um, yeah, like, like the one thing that would be important is that you actually have something of value to give their podcast. Um, but yeah, like, honestly, I think this would work way better if you actually started engaging with these hosts a lot, a lot sooner than when you actually wanted to get featured on the podcast. So it's, you know, like if you <clears throat> have like 20, 30, what, however many podcasts that you really want to get featured on, like before you actually send them a DM or an email, like I would really start engaging with them on social media, listening to their actual podcast and just becoming a really great fan. Because like, you know, a lot of podcast hosts, bloggers, authors, like a lot of these people read a lot or all of the comments that goes on under their stuff. Like, you know, I can tell you from experience of owning a media company, like I read like, you know, 50, 60% of the comments that, that people post uh, under the content that we put out. And so I remember a lot of the names of people that are consistently there and actually contributing positively to the debate. Like, yeah, obviously I remember some of the assholes as well, but like if they send me a message like, hey, I want to get featured in your magazine, I would be like, fuck off. But like, there's a lot of people that I remember, like, I remember their name, I remember their face, and, you know, if they, it turned out, like, hey, they actually had something to contribute to our magazine or our, our online magazine, and, and they shot me a message, like, I would recognize the name instantly, because they've been, for months or years, you know, posting quality comments, encouraging stuff, uh, like, you know, they've just been a good member of our community on our Facebook page or Instagram page, wherever, even our email list. Um, and so, you know, that's really one way to get noticed. And this is something that you will find here in this book as well. Um, but yeah, I would really recommend that whatever podcasts you want to get featured on, actually become a fan, actually listen to the podcast. If, you know, the podcast has any kind of social media presence, which it will, if it's a top ranking podcast, you know, start engaging in the discussion on those pages and, and make sure that you uh, actually contribute in a positive way. You know, whether that's 
you know, noticing something that happened in an episode and congratulating the host or or helping out members of their community, you know, who are maybe asking questions or, um, you know, whatever way you feel like, you know, being a fan of those podcasts. And once you have actually put that work in, then it's going to be so much easier for you to reach out to these hosts because like, hey, you know, a good percentage of them, if you actually do this consistently, uh, might actually remember your name. So I know it's a lot of work, but uh, if I wanted to get featured on a podcast or 10 or 20, this is the way I would go about doing it. Next question is from Stella Njezic. And their question is, how do I start working on the yearly financial plan for my e-commerce store? Planning, budgeting, evaluating, predicting. Business description and background. I own a personal sportswear brand in Croatia. We have been on the market for 18 months. I am noticing the lack of cash flow as I always need to buy in advance to sell later. From your experience, what would you suggest to work on to avoid a negative cash flow? So... I really love this question because um, when it comes to a lot of this financial stuff, I think most of us business owners who don't come from a kind of very analytical accounting kind of background, like we really tend to fall into analysis paralysis. Like I think it's happened to all of us. I'm guilty all the same. Um, and honestly, like in finance and, 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 you know, just generally planning the finances of your business, there's a lot of like big words and, and, and stuff that's thrown around, which can be really discouraging for us who don't come from that kind of a background. And so we tend to like believe that we are incapable of doing it or putting it off or asking for 15 different pieces of, pieces of advice or reading three books about it or hiring a really expensive consultant to do it. Like, honestly, the way like the best uh financial planning i always had was when i just sat down in front of a blank spreadsheet and started filling it out it honestly i'm pretty sure if you just search online like hey how to create a cash flow spreadsheet how to create a budget like they're going to come up with you know templates youtube videos stuff that can actually get you started just to like know the basics of like okay how does a cash flow table actually look like and, you know, especially if you are in the beginning stages, like your business is one and a half years old. Like uh, when I was running a startup company, I did all of this stuff myself and it really wasn't that complicated. Um, it's all about just, you know, getting past that analysis paralysis stage and opening a Google sheet or an Excel or whatever spreadsheet software you like to use, maybe in numbers on Mac. Um, and you know, just open it, find a good template, and and start filling it out. Like if you're gonna be looking at cash flow and budgets, uh, you're probably gonna be looking at an annual plan. You know, every single month, you're gonna be looking at your fixed costs, variable costs, um, planned revenue. Like, you know, as I said, I'm not an expert on this topic, but uh, yeah, like I, I would really just get started looking for some free tutorials or or whatever online just to get a basic understanding of how this works and, you know, start putting your numbers together. Um, once you actually have something in place, because um, really like, you know, your numbers best, especially at this stage, like, I don't, maybe you already work with an accountant, like, you know, they live next door from you. So like in Hungary, you have to have an accountant. So they might be able to assist you as well. I mean, at this stage of our business, um, yeah, like I have basically for our two separate companies, I have two separate accountants that give me financial reports. And um, yeah, like the, the only thing that I do in terms of financial planning is actually tell them like exactly what kind of reports I need to make management decisions. Um, you know, you might not be there yet. You may be, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, like if you do have an accountant or a CPA or, or you know, maybe a CFO, like, you know, try and work with them as well. Um, but really, if you don't, it's not a problem. You can really do a lot of this basic financial planning yourself. Like that's really the one message I want to hammer home here is like, it's not as complicated and it's not as scary as it usually seems. Just open up a spreadsheet and, you know, just do your best. You're going to be 
a lot further ahead than if you didn't try at all. And, you know, if you have some basic numbers together, like really, um, I would recommend like within uh, AO, you might want to reach out to Dan Abate, who is, I think, our best expert on this field. But, you know, Sean might be able to give you a better recommendation. But, you know, if, if you're going to be asking someone for specific advice, you know, don't go there with like, you know, nothing. Go there with at, at, at least, you know, one spreadsheet, one cash flow projection that you created yourself, something that you spent a couple of days on and really tried your best because it's gonna be so much easier for them to look at that and give you advice than to try and explain to you like how to start from scratch. So that would be my tip to get started. Next question comes from Ricardo Delgado. And their question is, how can I incentivize employees to stay longer with my company? Business description and background. I own and operate a barter business. I feel like if I can find a way to give the employees stock shares or bonuses, that would incentivize them to, to stick around more and grow with the business. If there's any strategies that have worked out there, I would like to hear about them. Thank you. So Ricardo, I would really, you know, I don't know the size of your business and I don't know how many employees you have, you know, just based on the profile of AO, I'm going to assume that you're in, you know, the startup stage or maybe doing a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm going to assume that you have, you know, a couple of employees, two, three, four, five, like something along those lines. Like if I'm making the wrong assumption here, then, you know, disregard everything that I'm saying. But if the assumptions are right, then uh, I would really recommend the following. So in our company, which is, you know, not much bigger than that, like at this stage, I think we have about, you know, with contractors and, and you know, like people that we don't directly employ, but, you know, with taking everyone on the team into account we have probably about 30 people working for us right now and uh, but you know two years ago it was like five people six um, so I definitely know what that's like as well and really what I found with incentives for a company of this size is that it's a very kind of personal thing like you for you know five maybe even for like 10 employees you're not going to be able to really in my opinion at least or in my experience you're not going to be able to find one like a one size fits all solution like at this size you really have to know your employees and really get to know them you know on a deeper level than simply like hey you know here's john he works here he's a cool employee like okay i don't know more about it like I know a lot about my employees, especially the ones that work directly on my team. And, you know, I think it's very important for us to understand <clears throat> their motivations of like, you know, why are they at your company? Because those are going to be the facts that allow you to create, you know, more kind of individualized plans to make sure that the compensation that you are offering is in line with what they're actually looking for. And by the way, it's completely okay to actually ask people as well, like, hey, like, you know, what would make you, um, I guess, like, it wouldn't be a good question to ask them, like, what would make you more motivated? But you can always ask them, like, hey, like, you know, you've been doing a really good job, like, obviously only if they were, but like, hey, you've been doing a really good job, and I was thinking about, um, you know, increasing your compensation or increasing your vacation time or whatever, like, hey, what would be, the best fit for you like really just try and make sure that you have a lot of two-way communication with your employees because like you know in in my team like you know there's someone that was very motivated simply from the fact of getting an end of year bonus somebody was motivated by you know a, you know some kind of small raises on a kind of regular basis um uh, for one of my best employees actually like you know, I had to get him a company car. Like that's the thing that kept him motivated, but he's like super motivated since he has the car. So like, you know, but if I got the car for a different employee, like, you know, they might be like, meh, I didn't even want the car. Like now I have to fill it up. Petrol's expensive now. What? Like why? You know, so like people have different needs. Like <clears throat> for someone like let's, you know, maybe they have, um, 
you know, a, a new family, maybe ha they have <clears throat> young kids, whatever, like for them, maybe it's going to be more time off, more vacation time. So like, you know, incentives are very diverse when it comes to a small business and a small team. I would really recommend that you don't try and make it too standardized because, um, you know, that's like big company stuff, which is different here. It's, it has to be much more individual. And really, I think one of the most important things that you can get out of this whole exercise is that you actually show your employees that you care. And, you know, for a company our size, that's actually one of the most important things because like, you know, like why would they work for someone that they think doesn't even care about them? Um, and yeah, like I have never given employees a stock share or, or anything of the sort. Um, I really haven't found it necessary. Like for our key employees, we never had problems with, uh, uh, you know, lack of motivation or, or, or lack of desire to work. Um, I never felt like a stock share or any kind of ownership stake in the business was necessary. Now, I don't know in your case, like, like the one thing I would say is if you have like a really, really key employee, that's like your absolute number two. And like, they, they started taking on a lot of responsibility. Um, and they're actually like making a huge difference in your business. Like, yeah, that's a different question, but you know, unless you're really there, like, like I wouldn't give a stock share to someone who is not an absolutely essential part of the business. And really, I don't think you should feel that you are obligated to, like, I think, I know this is a very kind of hot topic, like, you know, all these companies giving out stock options and, and ownership in the business. Like, you know, at the end of the day, you have to keep yourself motivated as well. And if you really dilute your own ownership of the company and your share of the profits, like, you know, at the end of the day or at the end of the year, you might find that, hey, you're the one who's lacking motivation because <laughs> you gave all your profits away. So, uh, yeah, just keep, make sure that you don't kind of overdo this exercise. Next question comes from Kelly Killingsworth. Question is, what steps would I need to take if I wanted to try and find and hire a commission-based salesperson since I, since I don't have a budget to pay a salary? but I know there is business out there. So Kelly, unfortunately, this is really not my area of expertise. I have never had to hire a salesperson and I haven't paid anyone on a commission basis. Um, within AO, I would really recommend that you send this question over to Tom Black, who is our world-class sales expert. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, this is really not my area of expertise. So those were the questions for today. I hope all of you got something out of today's session and I hope that I managed to give you guys some value. Uh, I'm gonna be trying to go live once every two weeks because I find like these sessions are actually a lot of fun for me as well. And uh, yeah, so I'll probably see you guys in two weeks time. Two things I would recommend if you send me questions, try and make sure that they are about either online marketing, sales funnels, you know, just growing your business online in general. Or uh, you can also ask me stuff about family business as well, like, you know, how you can handle the problems that arise, you know, when you have multiple generations of the same family uh, working within the same business and maybe having widely different uh, ideas of how the business should actually be run. Um, yeah, and since I was recently promoted to being the CEO of my company or our company, um, I guess now you can start asking me more of those kind of management type of questions as well. Um, yeah, I only have like a month and a half of experience in that, but you know, I'm a fast learner, so I'll try to get you some good answers on those topics as well. So uh, that was it for today. I hope you all had fun and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.